All right, so believe it or not, we have finally <laughs> made it to the last chapter in the Gospel of John and the last message in John's Gospel as well. So I have so enjoyed going through John with you. I have so been blessed by all the studies where we have just unearthed all those timeless truths that the Holy Spirit, right, led John to write some 2,000 years ago, still applicable today. By the way, quick side note, all 52 messages from the Gospel of John are on our website and on our podcast. And so if you want to continue to um, uh, grow in your faith or you missed a, a weekend or whatever, all of those messages are ready for you. Today is the epilogue. And what we're going to look at today is one of my favorite stories in all the Bible. I'm excited about this, okay? So excuse me if I jump up and down today. I just love this story. John 21 is a story of restoration and re-engagement. Can you guys please say the word restoration? restoration. And please say the word re-engagement. Re and now if you've read ahead, you know that this story is all about Peter and specifically Peter's restoration and Peter's re-engagement. But how many of you guys actually believe that all scripture has been given by inspiration of God? Do you guys believe that really, honestly? Do you believe that? Okay, and so literally in the Greek, all scripture has been breathed out by God and is profitable, right, for our teaching, for our reproof, for our correction, for our instruction in righteousness. And so because this book uh, has been written to us as well as to those people 2,000 years ago, I want to encourage all of us to keep our hearts open. How many of you guys believe not only the Bible is the Word of God, but the Spirit of God is in this room right now? I believe that with all my heart. I believe he's over there with the kids as well. And the Spirit is personal. He wants to speak to your heart. He wants to impress something on your heart today. So just don't just go through the motions, man. Open your heart, humble your heart to what the Lord may want to say. And I just want to say, man, if there's anybody that's here today and you've drifted from the Lord, I pray that today, like Peter 2,000 years ago, today would be the day of restoration for you and re-engagement in you following the Lord Jesus Christ. So if you're looking at John 1, uh, 21, verse 1, can you say amen so I know you're there? Amen. Guys, please bring your Bibles to church or at least pull it up on your smartphone or mobile device. We are a Bible-teaching church. Okay, John 21, verse 1. After this, Jesus revealed himself again to the disciples by the Sea of Tiberias, the Sea of Galilee. And he revealed himself in this way. Simon Peter, Thomas called the twin, Nathaniel of Cana and Galilee, the sons of Zebedee, that's James and John, and two other of his disciples were together. Okay, so that's seven disciples. Simon Peter said to them, I'm going fishing. And they said to him, we're going with you. And so they went out and they got into the boat. But that night they caught how many fish? Nothing. All right. So on the day of his resurrection, Jesus sent a message to his disciples. The message was, I want you guys to meet me later up in Galilee. And so what did the disciples do? Well, they were in Jerusalem, right? That's where Jesus was crucified, died, and was buried, and rose again, okay? And so if you ever have a problem on any map finding Jerusalem, all you gotta do is find the Dead Sea, go to the top, turn left. It's, Jerusalem's always there, okay? And so if you see Jerusalem, say amen. amen. So they packed their bags. Hey, Jesus wants to meet us in Galilee. And by the way, he's already, chapter 20, appeared to them twice. So he wants to meet us. They go up. We don't know which way they went. Maybe through Samaria. Maybe they crossed the Jordan River, went up to the Decapolis. We don't know. But they got up to Galilee, which is the mustard-colored region there um, at the top. So if you see Galilee, say amen. amen. And so they're there. And by the way, they're home. Um, 
Let me see if anybody knows the answer to this question. All of the 12 apostles were from Galilee, except for one guy. Does anybody remember his name? Judas. Judas was from Judea. Isn't that interesting? All the other guys were from Galilee. And so they're home. And they're waiting for Jesus. And they're waiting. And they're waiting and waiting and waiting. And they're waiting some more. And there's no Jesus. And finally, Peter's like, I'm going fishing. And the other one said, we're going with you. So they jumped on their boat. And by the way, if you go with us to Israel, I'll show you. I'll take you to a museum where they uncovered an actual boat from around that time period on the shores of the Sea of Galilee. It's amazing. They got on their boat and they went out onto the Sea of Galilee. If you see that, it's a big lake, but if you see that um, body of water at the top of your map, say amen. All right, so I want you to try to put yourself in Peter's wet sandals this morning. Just try to go back 2,000 years. Try to be there this morning. Try to think about the Bible and what's happening in this amazing story. How do you guys think Peter's feeling right about now? I think he's bummed out. I think he's really downhearted. I think he's discouraged. Why? Because it wasn't that much, that, uh, it wasn't too much um, earlier that Peter had done the unthinkable. Peter had denied the Lord, not once, not twice, but three times. He denied the one who poured himself into Peter for three and a half years or so. He denied even knowing Jesus. And so no doubt, Peter felt bad about that. He probably thought, man, Jesus is never going to use me again. And I'm just wondering out loud, is that why Peter said, I'm going fishing? Now, a guy that I read every week, Dr. Chuck Swindoll, he believes that's why. Check it out. I'm going fishing was not merely a plan to pass the unbearable meantime. Peter, ever the man of action, saw no future for himself in service to Christ. So he returned to his successful pre-Christ vocation. I agree with that statement. I think Peter is feeling really bad. I think he's, he knows, I messed up. I blew it. And he's probably thinking, I'll never be used again as a leader for the Lord. But here's the thing I want you to hear today. Romans 11:29 says this, and I quote, the gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. The gifts and calling of God are irrevocable. And so Jesus himself had gifted Peter. Jesus himself had called Peter. And so do you guys remember that story of when Jesus called Peter? Hit, hit the rewind in your mind. Go back about three years on the same shores of the Sea of Galilee. Jesus is walking along and he sees Peter and his brother Andrew there and they're casting a net into the water. And what in the world did Jesus say to Peter and Andrew. He said, and I want you guys to shout out the first two words there. Follow me. Follow me. Now, everybody, please look at me for a second. With all the love in my heart, I want you to know this morning that those two words are for you as an individual today. Jesus Christ is not just calling you to go to church. And by the way, we don't go to church, we are the church. Okay, we, we gather ourselves together because the Bible says, don't forsake the assembling of yourselves together as the manner of some is, right? So, so yes, in, that, in that, um, that verse, we should gather together, right, as the church. But, but listen, listen, listen. The Lord doesn't want you just to check a box every week and go to church. He wants you to follow him as an individual in your own life. And so, man, apply everything that I'm going to say today to you today, because I believe the Lord is calling some of you to get out of your religious habits and begin to understand the meaning behind what we're doing here as a gathering and begin to follow Jesus in your personal life. He said, follow me. Now check it out. And I will make you, what's the last three words there? Fishers of men. Okay, so what was their response? Peter and Andrew, I love it. Immediately, they left their nets and they followed him. Now, if Jesus called Peter to leave his nets and become a fisher of men, 
Why in the world in John chapter 21 has Peter picked up his nets and gone back to being a fisher of fish? And somebody might say, well, it's easy, pastor. He was hungry. <laughs> and I, I think there's a lot of truth to that, right? How many of you wives know that your husbands get really hungry sometimes, right? I'm really hungry right now. I can't wait to eat. But anyway, I think there's a lot of truth to that statement, but I think there's something deeper going on here in the Bible. I think Peter's going back to his old way of life. Ladies and gentlemen, listen to me, please. When the God of the universe, the creator and sustainer of all things, when he calls a man or calls a woman to do something, and that man or that woman receives that call from the Lord, by the way, how many of you guys know that's a privilege and an honor? And they receive that call. But then as time goes on, for whatever reason, you know, life happens. How many of you guys know life happens, right? and they drift away from that call and they go back to their old way of life. Let me ask you a question. Just answer it in your heart. Will that person be as blessed here as they would have been if they would have stayed over there? The answer is no. 10,000 times no. Now, I want you to look at the end of verse three here. Look at the end of verse three. They went out and they got into the boat, but that night they caught how many fish? Does anybody think Peter and the boys are being blessed here? <laughs> no. They are not being blessed here at all. Here, here's what I think. I think all of John chapter 21 is a divine setup by the sovereign Lord who even controls fish, I think it's all a divine setup by the sovereign Lord to go after a man that he loved, to go after that man and restore that man and get that man re-engaged in following him, and that man's name is Peter. That's what this whole chapter is all about, and don't forget, make sure you're applying it to yourself as well. Because all scripture is given by inspiration of God and is profitable for us, not just the ones who experienced it 2,000 years ago. And so look at verse four now. Just as the day was breaking, okay, so early, early in the morning, real quick, I want you to go to Israel with us sometime. I want you to someday, we go every year, I want you someday to see this for yourself. Okay, so if you're standing on the western shore of the Sea of Galilee and you're looking across, there's a mountain range on the west, I'm sorry, on the east side of the Sea of Galilee. So you're standing on the western side, you're looking at the eastern side of this big lake. And those mountains, by the way, is the mountain range we call now the Golan Heights. And so it's early in the morning and the sun is peeping up over the horizon. And what had been a very dark sky all night when they're catching nothing, now the sky is starting to brighten. There on the shore, post-resurrection appearance, is the Lord Jesus Christ. And again, I want you to hear this, he's coming to restore a man that he loved. And it says in verse four, as day was breaking, Jesus stood on the shore Yet the disciples did not know it was Jesus. And so Jesus said to them, right? This is literally a shout, because we'll find out in a minute, he's, they're, they're 100 yards away from him. Jesus said to them, children! In other words, hey, boys! Or if you're from England, lads, do you have any fish? Did you catch anything? And they answered him, no. Right, they're a frustrated and so verse 6 he said to them cast your net on the right side of the boat and you'll find some now think about this for a minute put yourself in the sandals of these fishermen most of them if not all of them are professional fishermen they've been at it all night long they're tired they're grumpy they're hungry and all of a sudden there's this stranger on the shore 
and he's yelling out to them, cast your net on the right side and you'll find some fish? That had to be the worst fishing advice these guys had ever heard in their entire lives. And they probably said, who is this guy? What does he know about fishing? We've been at this all night. We've been casting and recasting, casting and recasting, and now all of a sudden he thinks there's fish underneath the boat. But at some point, somebody must have said, hey, what do we got to lose? Just do it. Just cast it. Now look at the end of verse six. So they cast it and bam. That's in the original Greek. (laughs) Now they were not able to haul it in because of the quantity of fish. I love, love, love this story. (laughs) This is so cool. What is this called? This is called the miraculous catch of fish. This is, ladies and gentlemen, the eighth and final miracle that John recorded in the Gospel of John so that we would believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of the living God. You guys remember the list I kept putting up all these months of all the miracles? This is, we came finally to the last one. And so it says now in verse seven, that disciple whom Jesus loved, who's that? So he's reminding us again, Jesus loves me. So the disciple whom Jesus loved therefore said to Peter, it's the Lord. Okay, everybody look at me real quick. Why is, why is John recognizing this? Because Jesus had already done this miracle earlier. Not in John, it's recorded in Luke. How many of you guys have watched The Chosen? You guys remember the episode, right? Of when the fish were filling, so that's not this story, that's the story recorded in Luke's gospel that Jesus did during his ministry. So John, it jogs his memory, he's like, oh man, it's the Lord. And when Simon Peter heard that it was the Lord, he put on his outer garment, for he was stripped to work, and he threw himself into the sea. Gotta love impulsive Peter. Verse eight, the other disciples came in the boat, dragging the net full of fish, for they were not far from the land, but about a hundred yards off. And so, again, try to picture the Bible, okay? When you're having your devotions, please don't just read words. And check a box. Oh, I'm done. I read the Bible. No. Sila. You guys remember that, that term in Psalms? So think about it. Meditate on it. Right? And so um, there, there's Peter, and there's all these fish in the net, and the, the, the boat's probably tilting, right? And if you think they were going slow before, now they're really going slow as they're dragging the fish, and John's like, it's the Lord, Pete. It's the Lord. Peter's so excited to see Jesus. He wants to see Jesus. He can't get to Jesus fast enough, but the boat's going really slow. And so he's like, forget about it. He just dives in, right? And he begins to swim to the Lord. And he must have been a really good swimmer because it was 100 yards away. I wonder if he did the backstroke, right? As he's going into the Lord. And then here he comes. He comes up on the shore, right? And he's breathing heavy because he just swam 100 yards and he's dripping wet, right? And his eyes are like saucers because there standing before him is the risen Christ. Absolutely amazing story. By the way, it's not a myth. It's not a fairy tale. This is a true story. And so there's Jesus and there's Peter. And we pick it up and now in verse nine, it says, when they got on land... They saw a charcoal fire. I'm going to come back to that. In place. With fish laid out on it and bread. And Jesus said to them, Hey, bring some of the fish that you just caught. Verse 11. So Simon Peter went aboard and hauled the net ashore (laughs) full of what size fish? And how many of them? You know, Peter's just a strong guy. And although there were so many, the net, very interesting, was not torn. Now, I love Peter. I relate more to John in my own personal life, but I love Peter. He's such a colorful character. Not only is he impulsive, not only is he brash, not only does he put his foot in his mouth, not only is he emotional, but now we see he's strong. This guy's a big, burly guy. Jesus is like, hey, bring some of the fish that you just caught. And so he's like, excuse me, guys. And he goes and he grabs the net 
And how many fish were in there again? And what size were they? Large. Okay, so if, if, if they're about 15 inches long, I'm just guessing here, and they're Galilean tilapia and they weigh two pounds each, that's over 300 pounds and he drags it on shore, right? And then they see Jesus and what is he doing? Wow, he's making breakfast for them. Guys, ladies, isn't this why we love Jesus? He's ever the servant. This is amazing to me. This picture is absolutely amazing to me. It should be amazing to you as well. Why? Because the king of glory is standing on the shores of the Sea of Galilee, and he could have been in a palace in Jerusalem, and he could be telling everybody, bow, kneel, heal, bring me breakfast, and that breakfast better be good. But instead of that, you gotta understand the heart of Jesus, that the Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. That's Jesus, that's what he's doing here. I mean, come on. He already washed their smelly feet in the upper room as a servant, and now what is he doing? Now he's being a servant again, and he's making them breakfast on the beach. What does that mean for us? What's the application of point? No servant is greater than his master. What does that mean? That means that you and I need to become servants. We need to stop being all about me, myself, and I, and wanting to be served. And we, no matter what position we have in life, no matter if we're the boss or not, we need to become servants, right? Servants to our wives and husbands, servants to our kids, servants to our grandkids, servants to our neighbors, servants to our coworkers. Serve, serve, serve. And when we serve, what happens? The light of Jesus is so bright through your life, people will have to put sunglasses on in order to see your light. That's how people come to church, by the way because there's something different about us. These people are unusual. It's not all about them. It's about, they think, others. And that's attractive. Now, let's get away from all that, switch gears, talk about the 153 fish. For centuries, you need to know that scholars have tried to figure out the hidden meaning behind the number 153. And so they've come up for centuries with all kind of crazy allegorical interpretations to find the hidden meaning behind 153. Listen, with all due respect, because some of these guys in church history I have a ton of respect for, with all due respect to all of them, let me just say that's a mistake. I refer you to the golden rule of interpreting the Bible. Dr. David L. Cooper said, quote, when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense, lest you get nonsense. That's so important. Why is it so important? It's so important, ladies and gentlemen, because if you approach the Bible and you always try to find hidden meanings behind everything, you can make the Bible say whatever you want it to say. And that's what cults do. And so it's not up to us to take our ideas as good as we think they are. How many of you guys know people can become very spiritually haughty and prideful and try to impose our ideas on the biblical text? That's called eisegesis. We don't do eisegesis. We do exegesis. We pull out of the text what the Lord through the author is trying to communicate to us. We gotta rightly handle the word of truth. So when the plain sense of scripture makes common sense, seek no other sense. That's what Dr. Cooper said, and then others added that last part, because it's kind of funny and it rhymes, lest you get nonsense. Listen, the word hermeneutics simply means how to interpret the Bible. And it's very important that all teaching pastors that they take hermeneutics. Why? So they can learn how to rightly handle the word of truth so they're not, you guys understand the responsibility that is on me. That's why James says, don't let there be a lot of teachers because they're gonna have the stricter judgment. So can you please, please pray for your pastor? Okay, and so hermeneutics is very important to take that class in seminary. Why? so you're not leading people astray. 
And so what is the correct method of interpretation of the Bible? So I should have made this a point, but I didn't. So just remember these two words. Historical, grammatical. There you have it. The correct method of interpreting the Bible is the historical, grammatical method of interpretation. It's not the allegorical approach that many people in church history have taken. By the way, I just want to say thank God publicly for the Reformation. Even though I don't agree with the Reformers on every little uh, doctrine, here's what I know. I thank God for them because they got back to the plain meaning of the text. So when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense lest you get nonsense. Make sure that you're rightly handling the word of truth. Group leaders, let me just say this, that when you're leading your group, your small group here at Calvary, please, group leader, don't, don't sit there with the eight to 12 people in the circle and say, hey, everybody, why don't you, hey, Sally, why don't you tell us what you think this verse means? And hey, Harry, why don't you tell us your take on what is the, the, the interpretation here? Listen, with all due respect to Harry and Sally, oh man, why did I pick those two names? <laughs> George and Lisa. Okay, with all due respect to George and Lisa, we don't care what they think. We don't care. Because the Bible has one interpretation. Every verse, every passage has one interpretation. But how many of you guys know there's many applications? Right? Yeah. So what do we do? Some of you guys are getting offended right now. I don't mean to offend anybody. I'm just saying there's one interpretation, many applications. So we need to do our homework, study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly handling the word of truth. And we need to dig down, find out what that interpretation is, teach that interpretation, and then find out how can we apply this to our lives. That's the right way to approach the scriptures. And so, 1135, I love it because I got a little more time to talk about things. So why in the world did John say there's 153 fish? Here's why, because somebody counted them. <laughs> Every fisherman counts his fish, or fisher lady counts her fish, right? You go fishing, what do you do? You count. Someone asks you when you get home, and what do you do? You tell them the number, because you know the number. Now I know you lie about the size but you tell them how many, right? So every professional fisherman, Peter, James, John, were professional fishermen, tally their catch. And so that's why John records it here. But here's the, an even more important reason. If you're listening, say amen here. The reason he put this number in the Bible is so that we would see this is a bona fide miracle, and so we would believe in Jesus. And that's why he said the net didn't tear either. By the way, isn't that the purpose of the Gospel of John? I taught you guys this a couple weekends ago. Look at chapter 20 and verse 30. Chapter 20, verse 30. Here's the purpose of the Gospel of John. Now Jesus did many other signs in the presence of the disciples which are not written in the book, in this book. Verse 31, but these are written. These miracles are written. I'm going to see if you've been listening. How many miracles are there recorded? Eight. Thank you. These eight are written so that you, here's the purpose, may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. Now, switch gears again. There's 153 large fish. That's a lot of fish. There's no way these eight people can eat 153 fish in one city. So I think that they went and sold the rest at the market. And I think as they're going to the market, man, they're praising the Lord for his abundant provision. What an amazing lesson from Jesus to his people that if we'll just follow Jesus, he's gonna take care of us. How many of you guys know that my God shall supply all your need, not your greeds, all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus? By the way, never read a verse. What I mean by that is you never just read one verse by itself. You read the verses before and after 
and you keep the verse in its context because another principle of hermeneutics is some people, sometimes they're on Christian television, and they take verses out of context and they teach something completely different than what the context says. And so keep the verse in its context. What's the context of Philippians 4.19? We love to quote it, but what's the context? The context is that this church of Philippi was financially supporting the apostle Paul. And so in that context, Paul is saying, thank you. And then he says, my God shall supply all your need according to his riches and glory by Christ Jesus. He's thanking, everybody look at me, he's thanking the Philippian church because they were giving to him. And how many of you guys know when you give, your hand is open and it's easy for God to get some stuff back in there. But if you have a wrong attitude towards giving and you're stingy and your hand is closed, it's real hard for the Lord to get, it, get stuff in there. And I'm talking about material blessings, immaterial blessings, whatever. We gotta change, only God can change our hearts, but we gotta repent and ask God to change our hearts when it comes to this area of giving. The context is they're givers and God is giving back to them. How many of you guys know, give and it shall be given to you. Pressed down, shaken together, and running over shall men pour into your lap. That's in the Bible. I'm not a health, wealth, prosperity preacher. You guys know me better than that. I'm just teaching the word of God right here. And when you, if you just follow Jesus, man, he's gonna take care of you. How many of you guys know this? Uh, Matthew 6, Jesus says, seek first, not second, not third, not fourth, not fifth. You gotta stop putting Jesus on the back burner. You gotta seek him first. And when you seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, then all these things in the context, that's the necessities of life, will, that's a promise, be added unto you. How many of you guys know that where God guides, he provides? That's what he does. And he always keeps his promises. And if he has to move heaven and hell, He's gonna take care of you. But you need to put him first. You need to follow him. But if you go back to your old way of life, here's what I know. You may be casting that net all night long and you may not catch anything. So what's the application? The application is let's put Christ first in our lives. Come on church, we can do this. Let's put him first. Really honestly, in your heart before the Lord, in all honesty and integrity, just let him know, I'm gonna put you first. Why, what's the motive? Because how many of you guys know God likes to see motives? It's not to get rich. Please hear me on that. No, the number one reason that you put God first in your life is to honor and glorify him. How many of you guys know that he's worthy of all of our praise and honor and glory and adoration? That's why we put God first. And listen, a a fine, legitimate, secondary motivation is to get your needs met. That's what Jesus said in Matthew 6, Seek first the kingdom of God and all these things will be, as a promise, be added unto you. So as long as your first and primary goal and motive and God knows your heart and he knows my heart is to honor him, there's nothing wrong with letting that secondary motive be a motive in your heart. Look at verse 12. Jesus said to them, come and have breakfast. I love it, such a servant. Now none of his disciples dared ask him, who are you? Because they knew it was the Lord. And Jesus came and took the bread and he gave it to them so with the, and, um, and so with the fish. He's a servant. Verse 14, this was now the third time, remember the first two times he appeared was in John 20. This is now the third time that Jesus was revealed to the disciples after he was raised from the dead. Now, while they're all eating breakfast, picture the Bible in your head, and they're all sitting around this fire. I wonder, as they're warming themselves early morning by the fire, I just wonder if this fire is reminding Peter of anything. I wonder if this fire is reminding him of another fire not too long ago that was on the high priest's courtyard. You guys remember that fire, right? 
fact, we'll look at it, check it out. When Jesus was inside being illegally tried by the high priest outside on the courtyard, Peter was there. And it says, now the servants and officers had made a charcoal fire because it was cold. By the way, the same word in the Greek for charcoal fire in John 18, 18 on your screen is the same Greek word in John 21, verse 9 here in our text today. It's anthrakia. So catch the scene. During this very unexpected breakfast, Peter had no idea this was all going to happen. And while they're warming themselves by the fire, I think it all came back to him of when he was warming himself not too long ago around another fire on the high priest's courtyard, and everybody knows what he did at that time. He denied the Lord three times. Who made the fire? Jesus. You guys see why I believe this is all a divine setup by the sovereign king who controls fish, and he controls fires. He made the fire in order to jog Peter's memory and probe his conscience, you got to hear this part, not to condemn Peter, but to restore Peter. That's why Jesus is here. This is what this post-resurrection appearance is all about, because Jesus loves Peter, and he wants to restore him. So this fire, the fish, all of it is a beautiful setup for the conversation he's going to have with Peter in here in just a moment. But before we get there, let me say this, more application. How many of you guys know throughout our lives, there's always these two voices in our ears? Anybody ever experienced this? One's a voice of condemnation, and one's a voice of restoration, constantly in our ears. So I want to ask you a question. Which voice are you going to listen to in your life? The voice of condemnation or the voice of restoration? What voice are you going to listen to? The voice of the devil or the voice of Jesus Christ? Because both of them are talking in your ear. And how do you tell the difference, Pastor? One kicks you while you're down, and the other one is trying to restore you and love you and encourage you and lift you back up. That's the difference between the two voices. The voice of condemnation, you guys have been there before. I've been there before. You mess up, you sin, and the voice of condemnation is, look at you now. God is so done with you. Man, you you may as well go back to your old life. That's the voice of condemnation. The voice of restoration is, don't listen to him. I poured out my blood for you. You are my blood-bought child. I love you, I cherish you, and I wanna lift you up, and I wanna brush you off, and I want you to follow me. That's the difference between the voices. And you gotta have the discernment, church family, to listen to the right one, otherwise you're gonna be going down the wrong road of defeat, back into your old way of life, and frustrated, okay? And so please, get this today. Listen to the right voice. One is trying to bring you down, the other's trying to bring you up. And by the way, Jesus wasn't winking at Peter's sin. No, he's bringing it up. Why? Because... When we realize we're sinners, we see our need all the more for a savior, whether before we're saved or during our, during our time of walking with the Lord. And so how many of you guys know if we confess with our, I'm, I'm sorry, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. That's what Jesus is doing here. He's putting the sin in front of Peter. And he's getting him to repent so he can be restored. Listen. There is no restoration without repentance. And so I'm not trying to leave repentance out here. Repentance is very, very important. But here's what you need to know. The heart of your Savior towards you and I as sinners is a heart of restoration, not of condemnation. And so I want to really encourage you guys who are struggling with this. I want to really encourage you to read Psalm 103. Can you guys say Psalm 103? My favorite psalm in the whole Psalter. Read it, please read it later. I really encourage you guys to read Romans 8. Can you guys please say Romans 8? 
so important that you understand that, man, nothing is gonna separate you from the love of God. So I encourage you guys to read Ephesians 1. Can you please say Ephesians 1? That'll help you understand your identity in Jesus Christ, and it's as firm as a, the rock of Gibraltar. Nothing's gonna change it. All right, look at verse 15. Now it's time for the conversation. And when they had finished breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, feed my lambs. Woohoo! You know, I just get excited. I want to jump off the stage right now because as a pastor, I, I understand what's going on here. He is recommissioning Peter into the pastoral ministry here. Feed my lambs. Verse 16, he said to him a second time, Simon, son of John, do you love me? He said to him, yes, Lord, you know I love you. He said to him, different Greek word, tend my sheep. Verse 17, he said to him a third time, awkward. I mean, it's tense right now. Simon, son of John, do you love me? You guys know the answer to this, right? Shout it out loud. Why did he say, why did he ask him three times, do you love me? Yeah, he denied him three times. He's restoring him. Peter was grieved because he said to him the third time, do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know everything. You know I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. Now, in verse 15, he said, Simon, do you love me more than these? By the way, he uses his old name. That's interesting. I think it's because he's going back to his old way of life. Another sermon for another time, okay? But he says, do you love me more than these? What did Jesus mean by these? Was he talking about these disciples? In other words, it wasn't very long ago when Peter, boasting, says, Lord, even if they all fall away because of you, I will never fall away. And so now Jesus is like, hey, Peter, now that you've fallen away, do you really think you love me and are more committed to me than these other disciples? That's a legitimate interpretation. Or, I wish we could see Jesus pointing, right? Was he pointing at the fish? Right, because Peter went back to his old way of life. Simon, son of John, do you love me more than these 153 fish flopping in the net? Do you love me more than the boat and the net and the fish and the sea? Yes, Lord, you know I love you. Feed my sheep. Stop being a fisher of fish. Start being a fisher of men. I think that's a completely legitimate interpretation. Now, I understand that I just told you there's one interpretation. So in cases like this, so here's, here's more, you ever hear Paul Harvey say the rest of the story? Okay, and so here's group leaders, the rest of the story. If you're talking about minor doctrine, how many of you guys know we're not talking about the virgin birth here? Or the substitutionary death or the bodily resurrection? When you're talking about minor, minor doctrine, right? Like, what did he mean? Then I think it's appropriate to say, what do you think this means? Okay, so let's not be all dogmatic and pharisaical in our groups, but also just understand, all along, proper hermeneutics, there's always one interpretation. I can't wait to get home to heaven to get some of these questions answered because, honestly, I don't know which one it is. I go back and forth. And so, do you love me more than these? So, what's the more important issue? The more important issue is what did Jesus call Peter to do? Now, this is big. Here's what he called him to do. Feed my lambs. Tend, different Greek word, my sheep. Feed my sheep. So in the church, there are those who've been saved not too long and they're just learning to walk with the Lord. They are Christ's precious lambs. 
And in the church, there are those who've known the Lord for a long time. They've been walking with the Lord for a long time and they are Christ's precious sheep. So what is the pastor called to do? Here's what we're called to do. Part of the bad English. I'm supposed to feed all y'all. Lambs and sheep. That is my primary job description of what I'm called to do according to the Lord Jesus Christ. Okay, so what should pastors feed the church? Should we have pancakes and sausage, big breakfast every Sunday morning? Yeah. Big, fluffy pancake sausage. Not turkey sausage. Are you kidding me? It's got to be pork sausage, right? And warm syrup and butter. Okay, I'm going to close in prayer because I'm going over anyway. All right, no, no. Stay with me to the end, okay? Is that what I'm supposed to do? No, 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 no. I'm not supposed to feed you that which increases your waistline. I'm supposed to feed you that which increases your faith. That what helps you grow spiritually. What's that? Peter told us. As newborn babes desire the pure milk of the, shout it out, word, that you may grow thereby. That goes perfectly with what Jesus said. Man shall not live by bread alone, but by every what? Word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. How many of you guys know there's lots of words in that book? And not only that, that goes perfectly what, to what um, Paul said to his mentee, Pastor Timothy. He says this. Now, I'm gonna get excited, but guys, you gotta, gotta excuse me here. But I charge you in the presence of God. Now, does anybody think that first sentence is, is serious? Yeah, that's very, very serious. I charge you, the apostle is telling the pastor, I charge you in the presence of God and Christ Jesus, who is to judge the living and the dead by his appearing and his kingdom. Okay, what's the big charge? Here it is. Preach the word. Pastor, preach the word. That's what I've called you to do. You need to preach the word. You need to open the Bible before your people and you need to teach the word and preach the word of God. That's what you're called to do. You say, why in the world is that guy getting so excited? Here's why. Because a lot of American churches don't do that. They're done with that. Because they think that this Bible is boring and irrelevant. Anybody who thinks the Bible is boring and irrelevant obviously has not met the author of the Bible. Because when you have been born again, when you have been born again by the Spirit of God, man, you fall in love with the Word of God. In my BC days, there was a big old family Bible that was in the living room, and every once in a while when I was dusting as a kid, I'd open it up and see Revelation and get scared, and I would close it. I, I, I didn't care about the Word of God. But when I met Jesus Christ, I got in my car as a 17-year-old, I went to the Christian bookstore, and the first thing I did was buy a Bible because I couldn't get enough of it. Ladies and gentlemen, listen, I'm trying to help you in your walk with the Lord. You need to demand that your church teaches the word of God. Preach the word, be ready in season and out of season. Reprove, rebuke, exhort with complete patience and teaching. Why? For the time is coming when people will not endure sound teaching. Anybody know that time has come? But having itching ears, they will accumulate for themselves teachers. Why? To suit their own passions and their own desires. As I was meditating this week on this passage, I thought of a big old hound dog walking up to its master, and the master scratching his ears. And the dog's leg starts going like this, as he's like, oh, more, more, more. Now, I am not comparing a dog with anybody right now. But here's what I'm saying. A lot of churches in America, pastor, tell me what I want to hear, not what I need to hear. That's the difference. We need to get back to the Bible. And I have to, as your pastor, reprove and rebuke and exhort with all long suffering, no matter if somebody gets offended or not. I have to stand before the Lord and give an account someday. And so, hey, people are gonna come they're gonna have itching ears. They're gonna accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions, last part of that scripture. And guess what, everybody? 
that congregation is going to turn away from listening to the truth and they're going to wander off into myth. Is that a good thing or a bad thing? A bad thing. So as your pastor and as your shepherd, I am called to preach the word. I am called to teach the word. I'm called to feed the flock of God, the word of God. Lambs on their spiritual level, sheep on their spiritual level. I'm also called to tend. That means I gotta make sure as the pastor of this church, here's a great application for the word tend or shepherd. I gotta make sure we have ministries in this local church where you can be tended to as a lamb or a sheep, where you can be shepherded. That's like hospital ministry and shut-in ministry and widow ministry and prayer ministry and biblical guidance ministry and most important of all, groups. Because listen, you get into a group, man, that's where it's at. I love Sunday morning church. I think you guys know that, right? But man, groups, that's where it's at. Why? Because you're not in rows, you're in circles. And all of a sudden, somebody knows your name. And now you're praying and you're being prayed for. You're ministering and you're being ministered to. You're caring and you're being cared for. You're being tended and shepherded. So I just wanna encourage you guys, if you ever move away from poor St. Lucie, this area, and you go to another state or city or whatever it might be, and you're looking for a church, take your time and find an evangelical, Christ-honoring, Bible-teaching church. That's what you gotta do. Listen, whether it's a Calvary Chapel or not, that's not the main thing. The main thing, is that church evangelical? Is that church Christ-honoring? Is that church, the pastor's actually teaching the word of God regularly to his flock? And do they have ministries that I can be tended and shepherded? And if you're not finding that at the church, move on. Please, move on and find the church because God's got them all over the place that are feeding and tending the sheep. Let's finish this up. Verse 18, they're walking along the beach after breakfast. Jesus says to Peter, truly, truly, I say to you, when you were young, Peter, you used to dress yourself and walk wherever you wanted. But when you're old, you will, everybody look at me, stretch out your hands and another will dress you and carry you where you don't want to go. You say, how do you know he's talking about Peter's death, pastor? The next verse. This he said to show by what kind of what? Death he was to glorify God. And even after saying that, wow, Jesus said to Peter, follow me. So what kind of death is Peter gonna glorify God? Well, Jesus said, when you're old, you're gonna stretch out your hands. He's literally telling Peter, Peter, one day, you're gonna be crucified. Now Eusebius, who is a fourth century Christian scholar, quoted Origen, who's a third century Christian scholar, and Origen, who's not too far removed from all this, he says Peter was crucified at Rome with his head downwards as he himself had desired to suffer. So ladies and gentlemen, this is the kind of death by which Peter glorified God. He was crucified upside down. And Jesus prophesied it, Jesus called it three decades before it happened. By the way, how would you like to have that prophecy over your head the rest of your life? And yet, don't miss Origen's words, last line, Peter desired that. What? Yeah, Peter didn't listen to the health, wealth, prosperity gospel. No, 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 no. Peter knew the Lord, grew in the Lord, and as he continued to grow in the Lord, he was being shaped into the image of Christ to the point where he actually desired, that's spiritual maturity, martyrdom. And the same cross that he ran away from when he denied Jesus three times, I don't wanna get up on that cross like Jesus, I'm gonna go hide in an upper room. That's the same cross that Peter embraces later in life. Hey, your pastor and all of us, we got a long way to go, but praise God, he who began a good work in you will complete it until the day of Jesus Christ. Just keep following him. 
Just keep growing. And so, verse 20, Peter turned and he saw, guess who? The disciple whom Jesus loved. I guarantee you, when you die and go to heaven, if you know the Lord, and John introduces himself to you, he's gonna look at you and go, hi, I'm the one Jesus loves. Welcome to heaven. Just keep saying it and saying it. So the disciple whom Jesus loved, following them. So John is kind of back there, following them. And John wants us to know the one who also had leaned back against him during the supper and said, Lord, who is it that's gonna betray you? That, that's the guy, okay. Verse 21, when Peter saw John, he said to Jesus, Lord, what about this man? Okay, I'm gonna be crucified <laughs> later in life, but what about this guy? And Jesus in verse 22 said, if it is my will that he remain until I come, what is that to you? You follow me. So the saying spread abroad among the brothers that this disciple was not to die. Okay, so now around AD 90, John's got a correct the false rumor he says yet Jesus did not say to him that he was not to die but if it's my will that he remain until I come what is that to you and so hey I'm gonna be crucified but what about what about him Lord and Jesus is like Peter stay in your own lane right stop worrying about what I called him to do you just be concerned about what I called you to do you have your marching orders Feed my sheep, Pastor Pete. What's the application for the church family? Stay out of other people's business. Amen. Last two verses. This is the disciple who is bearing witness about these things and who has written these things and we know that his testimony is true. Come on, skeptics, please get this. John's an eyewitness, and he wrote it down. And we, probably the elders of the church of Ephesus, where he pastored as an old man, are putting their stamp of approval on this testimony. The Bible's the word of God. Stop being a skeptic. It's true. Verse 25, now there are also many other things that Jesus did were every one of them to be written. I suppose that the world itself could not contain the books that would be written. And so, by the way, that's hyperbole. So yes, we believe in the historical, grammatical, literal interpretation of the word of God, but we also understand there are figures of speech and metaphors, and there are symbols, and there are instances of hyperbole. So you gotta understand, but you still Look at the plain sense, and when the plain sense makes good sense, seek no other sense, lest you get nonsense. Can we please just glorify and praise the Lord for his gospel of John. His gospel of John.